Welcome to the dark forest Jackie and her pals will never bore us Shameless confessions about our obsession Will make us laugh and smile So let's explore the dark forest And dork down for a while Hey, it's Jackie Cation. Welcome to the Dork Forest. You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com, FamilyPetAncestry.com. You're probably already there. Let's do the credits. Mike Rickberg composed and sang that song with his wife, Sarah, that you just heard. He's going to sing his version of the Mexican hat dance at the end of the program. Patrick Brady is going to fix this audio, and Vilmos works on JackieCation.com, the website. There are many ways to support the show. The Amazon link is one. You can use an Amazon link from JackieCation.com or DorkForest.com to go to Amazon. You order like normal and it supports the show. There is a straight up donation button, PayPal or Venmo to this uh, email address that is mine, Jackie at JackieCation.com, where you can just donate to the show if you like the show a lot. I think PayPal has figured out a way to do a monthly. If you want to go monthly, please do. Other ways to support the show if you want to is you can buy merch. There's Dork Forest t-shirts and all the shirts are union made here in America. So they run a little big. Union Bayside. So if you want to look up their size chart. And then the other merch is my stand-up merch. On JackieCation.com, you can watch me do stand-up. You can look at my schedule and the stand-up merch, a couple of different t-shirts, a couple of different enamel pins, and all my CDs and my DVD. If you want to live stream my DVD, it's over there at ComedyFilmNerds.com. They have a live streaming capability, or you can get a hard copy of the DVD on my website. Oh, there are premium episodes at Bandcamp. The dorkforest.bandcamp.com has probably 10 episodes that were done live. They cost me a couple of bucks to make, so I charge you a couple of bucks. If you've run out of regular episodes, go over to ba- the dorkforest.bandcamp.com and get some more. Other than that, I say this. Let's get into the show. Hey, it's Jackie Cash. I'm in my living room, you guys, and I'm with Kat Alvarado. I did her podcast. She's doing my podcast. Hello Woo-hoo. and welcome to the program. Hi. Hello. You are at the Cat Alvarado. Cat spelled like a cat, C A T. Mm-hmm. Alvarado spelled like an Alvarado. Yes. Correct? <laughs> and a determiner right there at the beginning, the Cat Alvarado. And the de- the podcast of yours that I did was Villains of History. That is correct. Currently available on all the platforms. Mm-hmm. There we go. And if people go to Libsyn or, or iTunes or whatever, the place that they get their podcasts, they will find a Villains of History with me in it and with many other people in it mm-hmm. uh, talking about different villains. Yeah, we talked about Pol Pot. Yeah, we did. We were against it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what's going to be a theme on the villains of history, hence the name. Yes. Uh, so, Kat, uh, let's get right into it, right into your dorkdom, which is Latin American dictators, to no one's surprise. Yeah. Well Who played. knew? Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Why, why Latin American dictators? Uh, where, so... Let's let's have an overview of sort of how you got into villains and dictators, and then we'll dive in to the, why the Latin American, and then go from there. Sounds good. So uh, first things first, you should know that I um, I am Nicaraguan of Nicaraguan uh, heritage descent, ancestry. Descent. Yes, yes. Uh, and I wasn't always into dictators. Okay. <laughs> uh, what happened is I learned more about my heritage, and then I became fascinated with them. Right. Because I, I wanted to know more about, you know, where my family, where I, my mom is here. Cause she's, my dad's just a plain old boring White, American. Whitey Magoo? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, my mom was Whitey Magoo. Yeah. And my dad, Armenian. And so you wanted to know from wh- from whence your family ran. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Mine too. That's why I got into it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... I can't come to find they were running away from two guys. Oh, interesting. Well, like one after the other, really. Oh, okay. Because there was first there was a guy in Nicaragua. Uh, his last name was Somoza. Right, I remember that. And he had a dad. So it was like a dynasty. There were two guys. Right. Um, and they were awful. He was put in by the U.S. and supported by the U.S. And he's just one of those guys who's like, we won't be communist. And, and so we United will States be monsters. Like, but yeah. the United States was like, we don't care what you are as long as you're not communist. Yeah. We would like to buy your shit. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, And that wasn't good. And everybody was like not doing too well. Uh, very poor. A lot of... Um, 
economic inequality. And then everybody was like, what if we did like a communist thing and yeah. we all got better and people were on board with that. And yep. so everyone got real excited and got behind these guys called the Sandinistas. Oh yeah. And then uh, this guy, Daniel Ortega was their leader and he you know, went in there, they went in there, and they got rid of Samosa. Hooray! Yes. So good. We got rid of the bad guy. Right. And then they also turned into bad guys. <laughs> right. And because they were not supported by the United States at all, mm-hmm. and um, and so they could have been, you know, they, they could have, it, it could have, you know, I'm not saying that absolute power doesn't corrupt absolutely, but uh, I was there for that. I wasn't in Nicaragua for it, but I was, uh, I was, I was marching. There yeah. was, there was, I was, I was at college. There was sit-ins. Things were happening. Oh, really? Sure. I didn't I'm, know that. I'm a very old timey crystal clutcher. I have, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I was angry sitting down for apartheid against it. I was angry about uh, Samosa. I was pro Sandinista until I was anti Sandinista. <laughs> <laughs> Much like the Nicaraguan people, except for uh, from a distance. Yeah. So there you go. So um, that's fascinating. So what are the dates on? I I remember them. It was late 70s, early 80s. Yes. And that's when it all happened. That's when it all happened. So like 79 is when the Sandinistas took over and they took down Samosa. Right. And then they were basically in power until 1990. Right. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh wow. Okay. You so know, there they was lasted. there was a civil war going on during much of the the eighties though. Right. Like the late eighties, especially the Contras who were supported by the U.S. Right. were fighting the Sandinistas, and uh, they unfortunately though, like here's the thing: who wanted to fight against the Sandinistas? Samosa's guys. Right. So the United States was like, yeah, we'll fight these commies, and they mm-hmm. hire a bunch of monsters who were already monsters. Right. The previous monsters. They're yeah. just like, well, we know these guys. And uh, they've been around for about 30 years. So what is the history like? I mean, we don't have to go back to the Spanish, but let's go back. (laughs) Let's um, like what was like a post-World War Two? There was all this, you know, the toppling of empires Mm -hmm. and and supposedly independence by these countries where colonialism was done. Very differently, right? It was mm-hmm. done by economically. It was not done uh, with sort of this uh, kind hand of Whitey Magoo's, like, no, no, we're here to help as we steal all your resources. It was just very basic. We have a corporation. We're going to buy all your land and yeah. then we're going to put you to work. So, is that what it was with Nicaragua or? Under Samosa, pretty much, yeah. It yeah. was like, we got when the corporations, he... they come and work, and they... Yeah, when was he put into power? I want to say 1930s. Okay. Early 1930s. Okay, so he... He, so he was before World War II. Right, and then his son came in, mm-hmm. uh, in probably the 50s or 60s. Yeah. Yeah. And so there was this dynasty mm-hmm. that then ended in 79. Yes. Okay. And what... You know, the, th- the thing about dictators, now you study so many dictators, you hear about so many villains and dictators. Yeah. The, is there a common thread to their rise and fall and to what they do that allows it? Mm, that is a great question. I'd say they, they tend to make a lot of big promises yeah. and, and people get really excited about what they have to say. They don't come in there going like, hey, we're going to be monsters. It's always like, hey, we're, we're going to do some really cool stuff. Right. Whether it's like, we're going to make Italy great again. Or, right, right. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, right. Well, I mean, the, the, but they usually come in on the backs of some other monster, Right. Mm-hmm. So, well, things aren't good when they come into power. People are already wanting change. There's some kind of economic or social disruption. People are already unhappy. Because if they were happy, then they'd go with the status quo. They'd be like, "Get out of here! Everything's fine. We don't right. need any change at all." Right. And re- exactly. So, so things are, you know, they're, they're either it's artificially created discontent, mm-hmm. or it is, you know, in the case of like Hitler, and that was built on the backs of real discontent yeah. of post World War One poverty in Germany and mm-hmm. in Europe. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I'm trying to I'm trying to think if there's a pattern that you're seeing besides that. I mean, that could be the pattern, right? It's mainly that you get some main megalomaniacs. You don't always have that, you know. If you look at Salvador Allende in Chile, mm-hmm. he was the guy who would have been like almost the same as Daniel Ortega coming in to make everything better, economic inequality. We're going to fix it. We're going to yeah. be like. 
socialist and it's going to be awesome. He was actually planning on following the Constitution and being a regular president and right. just implementing socialist policies and being a good guy. Yeah. So it's it's not just the promises. It's also that combined with an asshole. Just mm. It's an asshole who comes in and typically they've got some sort of crap that went on in their younger years that's made them a megalomaniac like maybe they were neglected by a father figure <laughs> not enough hugs no, let there be some playing of catch out there you guys yeah uh, don't hug create a monster children. Yes. so who was the dictator in, in chile um you know chet pinochet augusto pinochet oh it was pinochet okay yes. yeah uh that's uh and so he pinochet, came in yeah he killed allende oh he killed allende mm-hmm. okay so yeah so let's go through like you want to do latin america Latin America includes, let's pretend I can't define it. <laughs> and let us just admit that I, when I think of Latin America, I think of both South America and Central America. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Does and it the also, Caribbean. And the Caribbean, does it include Cuba? Yes. Okay. So let's start uh, at the southern tip. Let's go Argentina. What okay. do you got? We've got... The Perones. I don't know too much about them. I haven't done their episode yet. <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay. So then what is, uh, what's next to Argentina? It's uh, uh, Peru. We've got Peru. We've got Chile. Right. As we go up, there, I'm sure there's been like Bolivian dictators, Uruguayan dictators, so like from, especially from the 1800s. I mean, there's just so, so many. Um, Right. Peasants have been uh, been oppressed, it turns out, since uh, <laughs> the idea that somebody created that they weren't a peasant. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> they're like, what we're going to do is I'm not going to be a peasant. You're going to be a peasant and then I'm going to oppress you. Yeah. We've and, got we've got then we've got Venezuela. OK. They've got. Uh, so what do right you know now, about Pinochet? Pinochet. Well, OK. OK. So I actually just released his episode. So okay. I have recently oh, learned about him. Yeah, so yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So Pinochet, mediocre guy in his early life, wasn't a great student, like a C student, B minus student. Oh, Not my God. Bad. Pol Pot. You're yeah. right. Oh, my God. That's true. Yeah. Of, uh, full of mediocrity. Okay. So much mediocrity. It's yeah. like it's it's like when you tell someone like you're never going to amount to anything and they're like, well, I'll show you. I'm going to amount you. to so much. Right. And, and unfortunately, that doesn't mean an amazing author. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> that's Not unfortunate. always. <laughs> yes. So, OK. So what what years are we talking about with Pinochet? Pinochet, he comes to power in like 73, 74, okay. leaves in like 1989, 1990-ish. Right, mm-hmm. right. And then, yeah, late 80s, if I remember correctly. So who, before him in Chile, what was it? Was it, uh, was it, it was, just another dictatorship that... It was, they had presidents, they had a constitution. It mm-hmm. was pretty run-of-the-mill standard elections and that kind of a thing. Nothing... Mm-hmm that radical or not radical not particularly left or right wing kind of unremarkable okay uh of course i'm sure chilean people would have a different (laughs) no no i'm sure the people of chile were like well no it was horrible and that's why we wanted pinochet well it was latin america so it was a lot of income inequality based off of spanish colonialism that was never healed up or fixed right Uh, taken over by uh, U.S., uh, you know, we own this hemisphere, so we're going to go in and, and do what we want and mm-hmm. build canals, and then maybe we'll give it to you. Yeah. Anyway, so so in, so in Pinochet comes in, and his promises are the same promises of everybody? No. So before Pinochet, so the story of Pinochet is a little bit unique because uh, Allende is the guy who comes in, and he wins a plurality of the votes. He's a left-wing guy. Uh, people are ready for that at that yeah. point in time because they see that um, – they see that. Wait, uh, sorry, uh, that's okay. Something about my head. Okay, um, so he won, wins a plurality of the votes in the election, right. but the thing is, a plurality is not a majority, and so there's still a lot of people who are moderates and who are conservatives who are not happy with that. And then some guys in his military plot, including Pinochet, mm-hmm. and they do a coup, and they. Oh, they do a coup. It's not Kill. parliamentary where they kick him out legally. No. They literally just go, oh, we're not pleased about this. That's not a distinctive win. Yeah, there were so, tanks and there were bombs of the capital where oh, he wow. was. And Allende has this whole thing where he goes and he makes a speech on the radio and then he kills himself with a gun given to him by Fidel Castro. Really? Mm-hmm. Weird. Yeah. And that's in 73 or something? Yes. Wow. Yeah, so and it's, it's he's like, so, so I tried. Uh, I guess I'm just gonna eat a bullet now. <laughs> Is that the whole thing, or, um, I or think was a it choice comes down between? To that, but 
were they going to murder him because they were rolling up the street? Yes, they were going to murder him because they were rolling up the street. He didn't okay. want them to murder him, so he did it. Although some historical accounts say that actually they did murder him, but that they made it a nicer story by saying he killed himself. Uh, who even knows? Well, I I'll, wasn't there. No, no, I'm sure there's three very old people who know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> they are sworn to secrecy because yes. they might have pulled the trigger. <laughs> so that's okay. So Andy kills himself. Mm-hmm. How long was he in office? Just a few years. Oh, so he did have a couple of years. A couple of years. It wasn't be- going so great, but was that Allende's fault? Maybe not, because Nixon and Kissinger teamed up to make, quote, the Chilean economy scream. Uh, so they were cutting them off from aid and loans and all that kind of stuff. No, that it wasn't his fault. And yeah. and, and the thing is, is, is you can't fix, you know, several hundred years of colonialism in three years, two or Mm-mm, three years. You can't. So, but he must have been interfering with so, some some paychecks come into the U S is, is what that sounds like. Yeah. Also the communism fears. Right. Which, um, which I wonder, I always wonder about whether that was people believe their own hype about that stuff, the Mm -hmm. domino theory and all of that thing. Or if they were just like, this is a theory. And, uh, because, because the domino theory of course, is that, is that if one country becomes communist, the next country will become communist. No one then says, why do you think that is? Oh, do they see that things are good? And they're like, well, we would also like that uh, even distribution of wealth. Not that communism, you know, has ever worked. It's. Yeah. Well, I think the challenging thing about it Mm -hmm. is that it plays out over such a long period of time. And an interesting story, a um, guy who's doing Latin American, John Liquizamo is doing Latin American history for morons. And he was talking about this book called Open Veins of Latin America. So I watched it on Netflix. Oh God, I got to read that book. I got the book. Started reading the book. And as I'm going through it, I'm going, wait, what are they talking about? Good things happening in Cuba? What? And then I look at when it was written. I go, oh my God, this was written before bad things happened in Cuba under Fidel. This was when the revolution had just started and things were just changing and excitement. And you could see the way things were being told was very like weighted towards everything in the past has been horrible. And there's this way, this new way of doing things. It's going to be great. Right. It's going to work. And everybody's like, oh my God, that's a great idea. Let's all do this. Mm -hmm. Right. And but history hadn't played out yet. So if you only read Open Veins of Latin America, you're going to finish that book and be like, I'm a fucking commie now. Right. And then, um, <laughs> if you don't read the rest of history that happens between that end of that book and today, right. then you're not going to know. Well, and the, and, the, and the problem with now, I don't know as much about, I mean, I have read something about Cuba and I know a little bit about Cuba. I don't know enough about Cuba to even talk, make these statements, but let's do it anyway, because okay. uh, it's the dork forest. What the <laughs> hell? Uh, <laughs> so I read a book called Havana Nocturne, mm-hmm. and it was essentially about how the mob tried to turn, um, and a guy named Meyer Lansky tried to turn Havana into Las Vegas. Yes. And um, and so it was very beautiful. And in the right after it was built, or right before it was finished, um Castro came into power. Yes. And so there was a lot of recrimination. And then I have also heard a lot of, you know, sort of Florida Cubans who lost everything in the Castro revolution. And I've, I've, I've read their side of it and they have a lot of anger because all of their stuff was taken and they ran out of Cuba with, you know, plenty, you know, several Scrooge McDuck piles of money, but not as they weren't living high on the hog like they always were. Right. So Castro comes into power and good things do happen. I mean, I remember, I think it was in the early 90s that I read that they had a like a 98% literacy rate in Cuba. And their lives, they were poor. And they were poor because of the embargo. And they were poor because of the sanctions. But they weren't... Um, there wasn't as much oppression as much as, and there was grift and there was, there was corruption and and the things that happened in, as far as I can tell, every government in the world. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know that there's a government that doesn't have uh, that kind of corruption. Well, I get what you're saying, Mm -hmm. but I think something a lot of people miss. And I think part of it is because we live in LA and we don't meet a lot of Cuban people. And, uh, and so we read about it kind of from a distance. We get the information that we can. Mm-hmm. And 
I've had the fortune of meeting more Cuban people just through my family. We, you know, we're married with my family's so mixed. We've got people yeah. married to people from Uruguay, Argentina, some Cubans. Like we're, yeah, yeah. we're just a bunch of big melting pot, a lot of American <laughs> people. Um, if I speak Spanish, people are like, what on earth is your accent? I'm like, I don't know. I just learned it from my family. That right. It's a hodgepodge. Uh, it's a potpourri. <laughs> yes. It's a San Fernando Valley. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and these people who I've, I've met over the years, they came to America from Cuba at different times. So it wasn't just right after Batista was taken down and the Cuban revolution, they all left hoarding their money. Right. Some people came because they were in tin starving. Foil. Yeah. In, Cause they were tin, starving. In yeah. The- throughout the years, um, escaping in mm-hmm. boats. Mm-hmm. There were also the Mariela boat lifts where people wanted to leave because they, um, they felt the oppression, the hunger, the poverty. It, things weren't going well. So one day, uh, Fidel was just like, all right, get the hell out of here. I'm going to let some boats come and take you away. Right. And that wasn't right after that. That my friend No, Jose, that was a dozen years or 15 years after. Yeah. Or 25 years, I think. That, mm-hmm. Wait, uh, what year was the was the mayor? I would have to look that one up. Right. But I, th- I think it was more like the 70s. And he came yeah. into power in the 50s, right? Mm-hmm. It was like 58 or 59. And... Um, yeah, Marielle boat lifts. They happened in 1980. 1980. Yeah, yeah. That was mm-hmm. um, so. So it's not all just people who are leaving hoarding their money. They were no, no, leaving the no, conditions. But, but I, I remember at the time in 1980, and this very possible because I lived in Wisconsin. So uh, there's going to be some anti-immigrant attitude uh, <laughs> from people whose parents were immigrants. And uh, the, uh, but the attitude was, is that uh, the demographic of the people on that boat were people that Castro himself wanted to get rid of. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of criminals and it was a lot of political enemies anyway. Yeah. So, well, there's not really any due process. So criminals is just anybody who wants to get rid of. Yeah. I mean, my, my friend, Jose Sardui, he's another comedian, right? You might know him. Um, he was saying how his father was actually a political prisoner because, so his, his dad's story Mm -hmm. is he was sent off to fight with the Cuban military. He was stationed somewhere and he Uh, found the Soviet union. Yep. He was fell in love with a lady. Mm -hmm. They had a child Mm -hmm. and then I guess he was brought back. And he didn't get to ever see the woman again. So he was very upset. He wrote a letter and mm-hmm. he put it up in the town square. Mm-hmm. And for having written this complaint letter, he had to go to jail for like two years. Right. So that these are the criminals. <laughs> right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, it's, uh, right. This is, the, that is, um, right. The, that is not, obviously, that is an abuse of power. Mm-hmm. And, and that abuse of power is so interesting to me because it can happen in in these in these smaller in in like a light a, a smaller populace yes like if there's not a lot of people a bully or a strong person can use their powers for ill oh, right yeah. and that's so you know the the difference it you know it it always confuses me about dictators where you just wonder it's so much brain space to be so full of hate, uh, I would I would make a terrible dictator. I I'm not saying I would make a good oligarch. Uh, I'm I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay being part of the aristocracy. It's uh, it seems to be working out for me. I'm sitting on a couch in Van Nuys, and uh, I own this couch. You're relative to the rest of the world, though. Uh, I'm fabulously wealthy, <laughs> yeah. and uh, the things are uh, I'm enormously grateful. But it's like it's so interesting that. That there, that I wouldn't. I mean, and I and I and I was raised in such a gravy boat of life, and it doesn't mean that my life was easy. But you wonder how bad someone's life is to is, because I I've met people that were that grew up with nothing, mm-hmm. and um, have so much oppression and so much, so much reason to be angry, so much reason to be full of hate and to take it out on other people, and who don't. Yeah. And you wonder why, how, who, who has, because the people who, like Pinochet, probably raised, just like you said, poorly, mm-hmm. and, and raised and has probably valid reasons to hate and valid reasons to be angry and to, and to be against even Pol Pot, right? To mm-hmm. be against the French and to be against, and then took that anger and that rage and turned it against people that weren't 
that didn't cause it. Well, I think sometimes it's just opportunity. Like if you think about who's like Fidel Castro and who mm-hmm. he was, you know, he was a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And I bet if he was just some guy here in LA, he'd be driving like a freaking Maserati around Beverly Hills with a bunch of younger girlfriends who are like questionably too young <laughs> to be with. Yeah, and that's have how a, it could have manifested if yeah, he had grown up here. Right? Exactly. At this time. But mm-hmm. instead he grew up there and, you know, he did have some strong beliefs about it and he... They did the revolution. There was a group of them. And I think at one point it probably was like genuine. We're doing a revolution. It's going to be great. We're going to make everything better. But then you look at what happens when they finally win. And it's like a little coalition of people who are going to take over Cuba. And he basically takes them out. Like there were two or three who were really, you know, the other possible Fidels. Okay. Oh, the other possible leaders. The other possible leaders. Yes. Okay. There was one by the name of Camilo uh, Cienfuegos, I believe. And there was one other one whose name escapes me. Right. But he basically just disappeared them. Okay. Um, like Camilo Cienfuegos, he like, he had, he played them against each other. He right. He had the other guy whose name I don't remember mm-hmm. go and like arrest Camilo Cienfuegos for mm-hmm. some, some made up bullshit. Up thing, yeah. Um, and then on their flight back, the plane disappeared. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he, he's, so here he is. He's just your, your standard person with a big ego who wants to achieve things and believes in a cause. Yeah. And then the second you put him in a thing where he's like, oh, I could get complete power. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. He makes the moves. Which makes, you know, like when, when you look at like American history and you look at the, the fact that George Washington, that's why it was such an amazing thing that he stood, stepped down after two terms. Yeah. And they all put him in power. You know, all of those all of those very, very powerful men put him in power because he was a pretty good figurehead. And they were like, okay, well, now we've sort of created a monster because he had his own ideas about governing as well and why he fought the war as well. So then they're like, oh, is this going to last forever? And then he steps down and Jefferson and Adams and all of these guys are like, okay, now we can get our, our thing back. And... But the fact that he was willing to step down, and it helped that he was old. Yeah. He was old and tired and wanted to sit under a tree, for, uh, <laughs> as the song goes in Hamilton. But he genuinely did want to – He literally, he wanted to go be mean to his slaves. And, oh, uh, no. yeah, he wasn't – Everybody's flawed, right? Yeah. I mean, George Washington, the fact that he stepped down is an amazing thing. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. He also only freed – most of his children, many Ooh. of his children were not freed oh uh, because they didn't pass for white. He only freed the ones that passed for white. Damn it. Ugh. Yep. It is unfortunate. Uh, George Washington famously had a set of wooden teeth. Did you know he also had a set of wooden? He also had a set of teeth. Made from, gonna, are they going to say he also had a set of wooden slaves? He also had a, a set of uh, teeth made from uh, the teeth of slaves. Oh. Disappointed. Ew. We don't know if they were dead when they pulled the teeth. I hope. We can only hope. Uh, and how did they die? Probably not natural causes. Anyway, so, but the thing is, is so, but the thing is, is all of these people, when, when they get into power, it's such a weird, I mean, even if you look at showbiz, those people who have power abuse it. Oh, yeah. And become, it just becomes, uh, you, you expect things. And that expectation can solidify into I deserve this and it only takes once for me to think that I deserve the Ritz Carlton right Mm -hmm. so how much more is it Tom Cruise who thinks that he should get anybody he wants you know you know or any of these guys right yeah or and when people say that you know working for Ellen is a is a pain in the ass because she's incredibly demanding you're like yeah, that's because she gets everything she wants. And why wouldn't she be demanding? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, she's just not getting the things she wanted. Oh, well, she asked for it. Uh, I bet she thinks she deserves it. And uh, so the same with the Harvey Weinstein's of the world mm-hmm. and the Louis C.K.'s and the you know whoever the fuck you know power corrupts. It genuinely does, and and you can go in. And so, in the eyes of Mad Eye Moody, 
uh, constant vigilance. Mm -hmm. And uh, (laughs) you just have to be very vigilant that you're using your powers for good. Absolutely. I actually was reading this book recently um, because I I have a nine to five Mm -hmm. and they gave me a, uh, they put me in a leadership training, which is nice. And it's a book called Tribal Leadership. And they talk about the five stages that people kind of exist in within an organization. You've got people who are uh, stage one people. That's like complete chaos. Everybody's grifters and, you know, Uh, selfish and murdering and stealing and just, right. Very few people are stage one. Okay. Um, stage two is everybody's kind of cynical. Like they're going to their job, but it's very much like office space. Like Mm. they're like, "Mm, this sucks. Uh, I'm going to steal a a stapler. Maybe, but they're like, ah, the ideas aren't good and the leadership sucks and, but I'm here and I'm going to collect my paycheck and go. Okay. Uh, Stage three is, uh, everybody's got an ego. It's about me. It's I'm awesome. And I want to achieve these goals. These goals are all about me and making me look better. Okay. Right? Stage four, there's like an epiphany that happens as people, because people can grow through these stages or right. they just stay in one. It kind of just depends on what happens in their life. Right. Um, from stage three, which is the ego based one, they can go to stage four, which is a team based one. Something happens in the mindset where they go, Between I want to have four. a legacy. Yes. Okay. And suddenly they go, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm only going to go so far in my legacy as a person. If I make it about me, I have to make it about other people. And so they start building a team and introducing person A, you know, if they're person A, they introduce person B to person C so that person C can grow. Okay. And person B can grow because now they know each other. There's a sense and, of community. Yeah. Okay. But there's still a sense of my community versus your community. Ah, okay. Stage five is the top. And that's where we go, my community and your community, let's all work together to do something better than we've ever even imagined. Okay. Star and so Trek. You transcend. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can go through all five of these and, and it's such a good book. Apparently it's like the number one leadership book in Russia, according to the oh, really? author, who's a USC professor, <laughs> Dave Logan. He gave Dave the whole Logan. workshop that I went to. And it's called tribal leadership, tribal leadership. All so right. good. So, so good. Um, and then when I look at history, you can kind of see a lot of these guys are either stage one or stage three. Okay. I want to say. I would say Pinochet was a stage two guy who's kind of like mediocre, like meh, meh, meh. And he just sort of fell into it. Yeah. Until he becomes like a stage three. All of a sudden the ego took over and he like bumped up the stage. Interesting. You know, it's, uh, I read a book once by a guy named uh, Taft. He was uh, President Taft's grandson. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, grandson or great nephew, whoever. He was my sister's boss. And he was the head of um, a a, uh, RBC Dane Rauscher Bank, um, Bank of Canada, um, mm-hmm. Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, there, he's a big fucking deal. Whatever, and he uh, <laughs> and he's uh, and he's an econ guy, and he wrote a book about sort of moral leadership hmm. and about how when the 2006 bank crisis happened how leading up to it and what happened after and how, because he was leading a large international bank at the time. And, and I guess RBC Dan Rauscher had turned down these, these bundled loans. Oh, really? Interesting. Yes. That he, he had, he had uh, people, commodity brokers coming to him saying, well, we can bundle all these mortgages and then you'll take a little piece of each. And he's like, well, how does that help? the clientele how does that help my my customers and they're like well it might help them but it'll definitely help the bank and he's like yeah i'm not in the business to help the bank the bank will make money whatever happens i'm trying to make my clients make more money and they're like oh he said and i don't think this is legal what are you doing <laughs> and uh and so and granted the book itself was sort of a you know a pat in the back to himself mm-hmm. but it was a pat in the back to himself for not falling into the trap of being a jackass. Well, it, it comes down to, and, and Dave Logan, uh, the tribal leadership guy, he he says it all comes down to values. And the great leadership comes down to you get a team to work together based off of shared values and a mission. Mm-hmm. And as long as like, you, you can 
say no to various ideas and other things and you look back at the mission, go, is it in line with our values? No? Okay, we're not going to do it then. Yes, right. let's do it. And uh, there you go with the Taft guy. It's right. exactly that. That's it. You know, it's fascinating because I remember um, in, in Havana Nocturne, it was Meyer Lansky was furious that uh, that he uh, he his legacy because he went on, I believe, to um, or he had just come from or he went on to uh, found Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And I think he had come from it. And the and he was vilified because of it, because it wasn't he was like. Well, you know, Rockefeller and Carnegie and those guys were all, they all were multi-bajillionaires who got all of their money off the backs of the working man and in criminal, you know, they were not squeaky clean guys either. I don't know why I'm being vilified. And someone explained to him that, you know, Rockefeller and Carnegie, they built libraries, Mm -hmm. they built museums, they built parks. He built a sin palace in the middle of the <laughs> desert where people could lose their money and mm-hmm. get hookers and you're like that's not the legacy of somebody who wants who's concerned about their legacy yeah it's a, it's someone who i mean it's a terrible legacy if that's what your legacy you no one's going to be proud of you right they're not going to say oh the rockefeller foundation is so great not remembering that the rockefellers were all you know, just dirt bags, you know, and Carnegie was a union buster and he, you know, took advantage of people. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is you get over this hump like Bill Gates, you know, you get all this money Mm -hmm. and then you're like, well, I would like a legacy. Yes. And so the legacy is, is I'm going to stop smallpox in Africa. And you're like, are you? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what he went to. I can't remember if it was smallpox, but it might've been AIDS. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he went to Africa, a continent, not just one country. Holy moly. Yeah. Whole continent. Whole continent. He's like, I, I was like, are you familiar with how many countries are? A lot of people. I don't know. All right. All right. Do whatever you want. <laughs> and so uh, like there's there's people that you think of now, like our modern day dictators mm-hmm. are these these corporate kind of corporate monsters. Yeah. Like, and, and it's like they get the on and on anonymity because except for the Koch brothers Mm -hmm. I can't name very many other of these guys like okay Jamie Diamond that one that name comes to mind isn't he like the head of Chase Bank he's a banking Uh, guy no I do his name's Diamond Diamond Uh, that is a little on the nose hope Uh, I'm not getting it wrong (laughs) well I'm thinking of the Bezos guy oh Jeff Bezos Bezos? okay so there's a few at the very tippity top where we know their names their Mm -hmm. household name but the rest of these giant corporation guys like can you name the who's the CEO of Dow Chemical I can't. They're probably doing something bad. Right. I'm sure he's. A, I'm sure he's got an island full of tiny children and dogs <laughs> that he gets to shoot. I'm pretty and, sure he's got several like uh, third world countries. He just freely dumps toxic waste in. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's something going, something horrible going on. But I mean, they seem to be like the current. They don't have to worry about their legacy because no one knows who they are. Right. Right. And so. I mean, but that's where the ego would come back in. Mm-hmm. You would think. I mean, it did it with Bill Gates, and. Um, Warren Buffett? Is that who I'm thinking It just all depends on... On the individual. On the individual, what experiences they have. Do they ever have that epiphany? And you know who even had that epiphany? Oddly enough, Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, who I did in the first episode of Villains of History. He's the guy who essentially was the first grand wizard of the KKK. Right, he was a he was a nightmare of a fella in Absolutely. the Civil War, right? He was, so he was a Confederate mm-hmm. um, cavalry general. Yeah, like he was yeah. like that guy on the horse who's like slashing people in half yeah. as he's riding through the battlefield. Right, right. And, and but he he fought for the Confederacy, but mm-hmm. he also was just a raider. Like mm-hmm. he just he just was a raping, pillaging, Brutal. looting horrible monster of a man. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh-huh. And under under him, the KKK. Like I want to say. Uh, there were there were like a thousand people at least who were killed and, mm-hmm, through their efforts to suppress voters once slaves could vote, once oh. African Americans were freed and could vote. That's right, because he yeah mm-hmm. he lived through the war. Yeah, and, and he became afterwards. the first Grand Wizard. Mm-hmm. Oh, what a piece of shit! Absolute piece of shit. But yeah. then get this random M Night Shyamalan twist <laughs> at the end. <laughs> His his wife, who's like a Quaker, some very Christian lady, takes him to church. Ugh. He was not religious his whole life. He's just like, fuck everything. I'm yeah. all about myself and my oh, ego and man. everything. So she takes him to a nice church, and, and I don't know what he heard. Whatever it was made him think about his legacy and what he was leaving behind. Mm-hmm. And in the final years of his life, he started uh, doing public 
speaking about healing between the races and how, you know, we shouldn't be racist anymore and wow. we embrace each other and how he was wrong. Wow. What? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh I wish I could hear that sermon. Like what, what yeah. did they say? Right, exactly. And what 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 was that guy selling? And uh and and how many years? And was it just a fear of mortality Possibly. or if it was and is it enough? You know, I mean, I want to believe in redemption and I want to give people a second chance, but that guy, how about you silently try to fix some shit yeah. instead of still being in the spotlight? And people and were pissed it. about it. People were real pissed about Well, maybe about that, I mean, change. maybe, maybe that's, maybe that is important that he speaks up then. Cause if he's that guy mm -hmm. who is like, cause he was, he was the face of, of hate. To then be the face of, hey, I was wrong. I mean, can um, you imagine how, how, uh, how like shocked those people must have been? That's like Donald Trump coming out to suddenly support immigrants' rights. Right. Or to laugh at a fucking joke. Anything. <laughs> uh, just to show some something human. Anything. Yeah. Uh, that guy, he, you know, somebody told me that he, they've never heard him laugh um, at anything, like, except for at people. They've never heard him laugh at a that joke or so enjoy. Creepy. It is spooky as fuck, is what it is. That means and, I think that's like official. He's a sociopath, right? That's sociopathic, yeah. and uh, and you're like, oh, interesting. I mean, because you would think, well, he has grandchildren. Like you, when you think about um, who had the man size safe uh, in uh, George W. Bush's, he was the Secretary of State. He was uh, evil, Donald evil. Rumsfeld. Well, Rumsfeld uh, well, was, was he it? Secretary of State? He Is might have been. I'm thinking of Chief of Staff, maybe. Chief Whatever. Staff. Someone's yelling it. He's horrible. Uh, and uh, <laughs> but he shot somebody in the face. Remember the guy who shot? Oh, somebody? Dick Cheney. Yeah, Dick Cheney. So what? I sometimes I think about Dick Cheney's uh, grandchildren, and and I'm like, I think Dick Cheney's probably a, he probably is a pretty good grandpa. Uh, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> Same with Richard Nixon. I hear he was like a really sweet dad and a very fun husband. <laughs> nope. Could give a shit. Anyway, would love you to put in a pillory. How about that? Well, just a little stockade and uh, just anything. Um, I'm literally going back to some real 1700s here. I would like people <laughs> to be punished in a very public shaming way. You know, we should go back to that. Not not like Twitter public shamed, although I kind of feel like maybe we do have it. It's maybe like a we do. Maybe that's what it is. Via Twitter, you just get to be yelled at by trolls in exactly. 140 characters at a time. That's the equivalent of like a tomato to the face. I got I got somebody yell at me yesterday uh, about something I said. And uh, so, I f of course, you follow them back to their page to see their three followers mm -hmm. and the fact that they are an egg and they don't have a <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a profile picture or anything going their on. Their handle ends in like 17 numbers. <laughs> right. Or, or nobody you know follows them. Uh, you know that sentence underneath it? And uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you're mm -hmm. like... Oh, uh, I could engage or I could just block you because in real life I would not hang out. And yeah. so that, that's my new thing on Twitter. I'm like, uh, or the internet in general. I'm like, if in, if in person someone were rude to me or mean to me, uh, what would I do? Well, I would probably not hang out with that person. I wouldn't continue to have a conversation. Um, I was, uh, yeah. So, uh, we just time to wrap it. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I'm so sorry. We, uh, uh, we've digressed, but we've talked a lot about villainy. Mm -hmm. Is there, do you have a favorite, uh, <laughs> Latin American dictator? A favorite dictator? Oh, that's uh, a great question. I want to say, I want to end it on a positive note. Well, I you recently got 20 read, minutes. Oh, you got, you got oh, 20 times. minutes. Yeah. I you got, got the rest of your life. Let's see. Favorite dictator. Let's think about that. Um, are there are there dictators with great stories that we haven't heard? Uh, Brazil has Brazil ever had a dictator? Ah, uh, don't they currently have one? Just kidding. They Probably don't. he's a president, but maybe but, we'll see what happens in five years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I don't have good hopes it, for Brazil. God bless them. Uh, uh, well, it's all in Portuguese, so yeah. good luck. <laughs> and uh, gosh, there's so many who are interesting. What I mean, about Haiti? Haiti's they've full got, of injustice. They've got that. I haven't done an episode on him yet, so I don't know too much in detail mm -hmm. about him. Um, favorite, favorite dictator. Dominican Republic. Yeah, the I was, was going to talk about Trujillo. Trujillo, that's Trujillo. right. That's He's a Dominican name. Republic guy, and I've got an episode about him that came out a couple weeks ago. You mm -hmm. can check it out. Um by the way, I am talking with the Cat Alvarado, which is her handle on all the things, and the name of your podcast, Villains of History. That anyway, is correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
I love this story. It's not so much about Trujillo. He's not my favorite. He sucks. All the dictators suck. So it's hard right. to pick a favorite because I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, his evil was a particular brand. Oh, right. it's wonderful. It was a little fruity blend. <laughs> oh, no. And it, it had a, a tobacco flavor. And it, no, I mean, like the great stories of, 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 of dictators. You, I mean, how many episodes are villains of history? Right now, um, we're like probably at about 30. 30? At, so, at, when this is airing, we'll be at about 30. Yeah. Um, you know, there are, are some really great ones. I, I love the story of Augusto Pinochet because it's just so rich and interesting. And it's kind of the opposite of a lot of the other stories where here it's like a Marxist guy and his story is actually like the opposite. He comes in, he takes over for Allende, that oh, whole right. thing. And, um, and really the way he's taken down is essentially through democratic means too. Really? Uh, and there's Pinoch a lot of great documentaries you can watch on that. But one of my favorite stories is the story of the Mirabal sisters in the Dominican Republic. Okay. Um, and I talk about this when I go to colleges and they're like, can you, can you make a speech to help encourage people to vote and get involved? Oh, yeah. uh, I love this story and I use this story, um, which is so under Trujillo, it was very oppressive mm -hmm. and he had his thugs go out and they would pick pretty girls and mm -hmm. bring them back for him to sleep with. Ugh. It was a horrible, shitty right. monster. And he was at this party. He sees this girl, uh, one of the Mirabal sisters. Mm -hmm. And he sees her and he approaches her. He propositions her. She says no. And in some accounts, slaps him across the face. Which is insane to do right. to the dictator. You might as well have had Castro give you a gun. Anyway. Pretty so, much. Yeah. And so she is that she and her sisters, her whole family is basically punished for her rejecting him. He right. makes people not do business with her family. So they suffer economically. She decides she wants to, she goes to law school. She's able to get in, but when she graduates, she, he denies her a license to practice, so she cannot practice law. Wow. And so she and her sister. But this is, this is a spiteful, petty, years in the making kind of drama. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. That's from like when she's a teenager and he hits on her all the way through the end of not college, but law school. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. This is some serious. He puts her father in jail for a little bit, too. What? Yeah. Because is... she won't bang him. That is Banana Land. Mm -hmm. what, uh, Trujillo, right? Trujillo. 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 Also known as El Jefe, the boss. Oh, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but he doesn't kill her. He doesn't he kill her family. Doesn't. Uh, initially. Initially. Yes. And then, so she gets married. Her sisters get married. And the husbands are anti-Trujillo as well. I mean, of course as they are. They support their wives. Yes. And. They all team Who up. marries into that? You're like, <laughs> you are a cursed family. Would that we lived not here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they get together with some other people and they form a group called El, uh, Los Catorce or the, the 14th. Okay. El Catorce. Um, and it's the 14th. It's named after a failed coup attempt against Trujillo. Okay. And they organize against him. They pass out pamphlets to raise awareness of the basically ethnic cleansing that Trujillo has done because he went, he's like slaughtered tens of thousands of Haitians okay. in the Parsley Massacre. Look that up. That's awful. Right. Um, and so they're raising awareness about, about the Parsley Massacre. They're sneaking stuff to build bombs, to build guns. Mm -hmm. It said that they would like have evenings with the family, with the kids, mm -hmm. and they'd be like me making bombs. Like instead of Oh, like Terminator brownies. 2. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they were... They were some badass women. Yeah. They had a fourth sister who her husband was like, you're not getting involved in that. Yeah. And so she didn't. She just watched <laughs> from a distance. So at one point, Trujillo puts all of them in jail. Then he lets the women go mm -hmm. and he has the men. Well, the women come to visit their husbands, mm -hmm. the Mirabal sisters. And on their way home from visiting the husbands, their truck is pulled over. And they are beaten to death and then strangled as well. Then their bodies are put back in the truck and they make it seem as though they had driven off of an embankment. Right. Killed. So very, very sad. Holy smokes. Yes. And the thing about it 
is their deaths were not in vain. Okay. Because this woke up the country. You got to understand about Latin American culture. It's very machista and it's a slap to the face of all of the men in the right. Dominican Republic that their women had to die to get rid of Trujillo because they weren't men enough to get rid of this dictator themselves. <laughs> oh my God. That is exactly. <laughs> okay. And so that sort of lit a fire under them. Absolutely. Which is so funny because that is exactly what uh, my Vietnamese uh, tour guide said because he was telling <laughs> us about how there were three different ways the women are kidnapped in Vietnam at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, one way is uh, they are sold to China when they uh, they are stolen from from Vietnam uh, in the night by ch the, uh, by essentially just kidnappers. Mm -hmm. uh, another way is uh, a Vietnamese girl will graduate from college. Her boyfriend from college will take her to a, over the border to a Chinese market to buy things, and he will sell her <gasps> to the Chinese. And the third way is when uh, a, an older Vietnamese woman uh, is sold by her husband uh, just to get rid of her. And what? so these are the three ways that the Chinese are stealing Vietnamese women, according to my Vietnamese tour guide. Now, he tells us this story. The bus is all just Australian, New Zealand, British, American, Whitey Magoos. Um, he's telling the story, and then he goes, yes, yes, it is very much, there's a lot of shame among the men. This is very hard on the men of Vietnam. And we, every woman on that bus was like, what just happened? Wait, what, what? Oh, yeah. You don't think it's a little hard on the women of Vietnam that they are being sold into slavery so they can breed and do laundry? And, uh, and he's like, well, yes, yes, but this is very hard on the men of Vietnam. We're like, well, what are you going to do about it? And he's like, well, it is China, so I don't think we're going to do anything about it. <laughs> so oh, no. I was like, oh, Christ. Okay. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So that is, but that lit a fire it under did. the people of the Dominican mm -hmm. Republic. And within the year, they had managed to kill Trujillo, which they had not managed to do for 30 years. Wow. So, so these three women died. They did die. And the fourth sister who didn't get involved, she raised their children and oh, okay. she continues their legacy. There's a museum there. Children in Dominican Republic are taught about them. Oh, okay. Um, they're also known as the butterflies, las mariposas. Okay. And they That's are neat. known as heroes. Yeah. In Dominican Republic. I love the story. And That's I a beautiful story. I tell the story to the students because I say, because right now a lot of people are very hopeless. Yeah. They're like, man, There's no one a has lot a of chance. Despair. Yeah. No one has a chance to win. You know, no one's excited about Biden. Uh, Bernie's too far to the left. Some people say they think Elizabeth is too. Harris has all kinds of things that are problematic in her background and nobody else will vote a, for the rest of them. No well, one's heard of them. <laughs> it's a Castro seems great, but I guess he was just mean to Biden and that kicked him out, but he just wasn't high enough on the, on the, on the list. And, yeah. And, and Warren is, a, a, I a, love her, but yeah. right. Uh, to quote my father, uh, she's overqualified, but she's not hot. Oh. And, uh, and Harris is hot, but she's, uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, she's black. And then, um, and they're both women. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, what will happen? Uh, well, I don't know. Shit might get done. Anyway, so, uh, and then uh, everybody else is a hundred million years old. And, yeah. um, and, and so people feel really hopeless because they're like, well, we're probably going to lose. And then <laughs> global warming is going to kill us all <laughs> if a mass shooter doesn't first. So, right. Ugh. So telling that story. So I say, you know what? You know who had even less hope? The Mirabel sisters and the people of the Dominican Republic. Because and they if kept they getting even, up every day. Yeah, they kept on going, even if just saying something. I, I have a friend, Danielle Perez. Danielle Perez, have you had her on here? You should have her uh, on here. I want to have her on here. She's great. Uh, she is great. She's Dominican, and she told me a story of her, I want to say, uncle mm -hmm. from there. I had her on for the Trujillo episode. Yeah. And her uncle said something. There was like a political rally for mm -hmm. Trujillo. He goes, I don't want to go to that stupid rally. Next thing you know, a bunch of thugs show up a few hours later. He mm -hmm. disappears for a couple of days. When he comes back, he is all about Trujillo, and he never said anything bad about Trujillo again because and he uh, didn't talk about up. what happened. Yeah, they probably yeah. tortured him. Yeah. That's the kind of oppression that the Dominican, the people in the Dominican Republic lived under. They, they couldn't even speak up. So how can we not speak up and try to get out there and win this freaking election? Right, right. There's only like 20,000 uh 
actual active morons who show up to these rallies. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bunch of white supremacists who are willing to throw money at it. And then there's more of us than them. And uh, we, uh, and we, you know, the, we just have to fight the worm people. The worm people have been living under rocks uh, peacefully uh, for hundreds of years. And when we get on the other side of this, it will be better. I swear to God, it will be, it'll be worse before it gets better, but it will be better on the other side of it because, we will have addressed something that we've never addressed. And history is full of, of times where things were hopeless. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said, you know what? I know it's hopeless, but we're going to try and do it anyway. It's that stage five leadership. Those yeah. people who go, you know what? We've never done this before, but we're going to make it happen. And it doesn't matter about ego. We could lose. Who cares? It's worth trying and we're going to go for it. And and that's why we even live in the awesome world that we do, because someone was willing to be that leader. George Washington was right. willing to be that leader. Right. And it was, and the, the, there's, people are like, well, what do you mean by that? What do you do then? And I was like, well, you do as much as you can. And at the very least, you stand up for what's in front of you. You know, if, if the only thing you can do is to stand up to a racist at a grocery store, if the only thing that you can do is to help a child on the street, or if there's the only thing you can do is to surround a car while ice comes and tries to bully them into getting out of that car, do that. It's one little thing, but it, if you think about how a computer works, it's got all those little parts in it. All those little parts just do one thing, but you put it together. It's a fucking computer. Right. So we all are one of those parts. We're just a, you're, you, you don't have to be the leader unless you can be the leader. You can be a cog that, that works towards the betterment. I mean, if you look at a car, it, one thing goes wrong in your car and you can't start it. It's a freaking little, the, yeah, it's any just of, any, anything, I, one right. little thing. There's That's how important things. all of the little things are yeah. in a car. I know nothing about cars. All I know <laughs> is that like one tiny wire is off and then I can't drive it and I have to pay someone a thousand dollars. Exactly. Because it's been made complicated. But I want to, I want to talk about one like thing, yeah. one final thing um, from the leadership training that they had me do. We did this really cool thing. It's called metaphor spelled meta dash four. You can probably find it on YouTube and it's this exercise for about 30 people in the room. Yep. There's a, you follow me here. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, everybody's given two poker chips of two different colors. There is blue, red, and white poker chips. Okay. And at the front, we can exchange our poker chips for dominoes. You okay. have to have three poker, one, a red, a blue, and a white. For one, one of domino. each to get a domino. Yeah. And the objective is for all 30 people to each get a domino to survive the round. Okay. But we get, we get infinite round. We can have as many rounds as we want. Right. But the goal is for them all to survive in one round. Because yeah. at the end of the round, you reset. Yeah. And the first time we do the exercise, everybody is in for themselves. And you have to kind of trade and get convince someone to give you one and be like, I'll be right back and I'll bring you yours. And then you can get a domino too. Oh, right. And only half the people survive. Ah. Uh. So we all start kind of team. The second round, some people are like, what if we team up? The rest of us are like, we're not going to. Why would I team up? I got my domino. I'm not going to contribute. Mm -hmm. the, the third round, we start to see like, oh, the people who teamed up, we, they did a little bit. We know what? Let's see what happens if we team up. Yeah. But the fourth round, now we're like, all right, we all have roles. We've got a table right here. We're going to start matching up sets of the three so yeah. that one person can Everybody hand them over. Everybody just put their fucking co to tokens down. Yeah, they put our and tokens start together. start making threes. Exactly. We started a, a, a whole assembly line. Yeah. And by round six, we saved everybody. And I really didn't think it was going to happen because I was one of those skeptics who was like, I don't know if I'm going to participate. But then I was like, what the heck? I'll be part of the assembly line and just be the little cog in the yeah. machine and see if we can't save the whole 30 people. And then we freaking did. And it was mind blowing how. I bet you the psychology in the yeah. beginning, because they explain it, they're like, well, every, this is what you need to do this. So now go forth and trade. Mm -hmm. And they don't say, if you, if you all just sit at one table, everybody puts all their coins in and then you put them together. Um, because, because that, I mean, if you think about it, you have to relearn something like that, that metaphor uh, exercise from when you were a toddler. You know, they're just like, when you say to a toddler, I would like to play with that toy, or I would like to see that toy. They're like, no. And you're like, but if you say, I would like to see that toy, I will give it back to you. They have been taught that they have to, they have to share. Mm -hmm. And we're all taught as children. Whenever I meet like adults, 
who are like libertarians or or and very right wingy kind of like they they don't believe that there's enough and they don't and they believe that 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 it's it's some sort of mer- like not a not even a meritocracy but sort of a meritocracy where you're like well if they haven't worked hard enough they're not smart enough it's like i got to get mine I'm gonna and get if mine, you don't get yours too bad too bad mm-hmm. and you're like do you were you never 4 years old because we were all taught by our parents that we had to share and then you had to unlearn it and now you're a 25 year old jackass and you read Ayn Rand and you're you've <laughs> lost your mind mm-hmm. and because the thing is is we all need clean water we all need clean air and we all need shelter and we all need food. And so when you, when we're in Los Angeles and there's a hundred thousand homeless people without houses here, what are they called now? Um, they're not called homeless anymore. The, the, the humans that are, that are living on the streets, they're called, um, the under the bridge people. Yes. No, they're not called that. <laughs> they're called, uh, uh, like housing impaired or something. Oh There's God. a long, uh, PTSD kind of word that is now being used. Housing and, challenged. Uh, houseless or something like okay. that. And, and the thing is, is you can build housing for everyone that will make you a little bit of money if you were a landowner. It will not make you condo money. It will not get the 1% to come and do the thing. But mm-hmm. but it, this is such a great exercise, this metaphor. It's, it's amazing because you really see how if we all just let the ego go for a second mm-hmm. and you know pitch in our piece, mm-hmm. we can save the whole group. Uh, it was it was amazing and how just spontaneously we came up with like supply chain dynamics and, yeah, a, yeah. and a whole freaking assembly line like wow and and the most mind-blowing part is that all I had to contribute to that was just moving I was just in the middle of the assembly line moving one grabbing a set of three poker mm-hmm. chips handing them to the other guy just me grabbing handing it off grabbing it handing it off and what that was, was that my guy job doing? He was getting them and giving them to the domino guy and getting back a domino. Then he'd hand that domino to the girl who was passing the dominoes out. (laughs) All right. So everyone had a a place and everyone had a task. And and everyone was important in that. Without each one of those people, Mm -hmm. we wouldn't have accomplished what we could. If one person said that they couldn't have done it, two people would have died. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So maybe three. I don't know the math on that. That's kind of amazing. It really was. This has been a very hopeful episode about villains, <laughs> Pat Alvarado. Thank you so much for doing the Bedork Forest. We're at like 59. Wow. So, perfect timing. Not bad. <laughs> and uh, so everybody, at uh, at the Cat Alvarado and Villains of History, the podcast. And thank you very much for coming and doing the Bedork Forest. Thank you for having me. And Rangers, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat, <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh my god. Thank we you. why don't we just call that as the end of the show?